Good, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's very good to see the house uh, so full. Uh, <laughs> nonsense. Um, uh, David, welcome. It's very, very good to see you in London again, and especially good to see you here at uh, Chatham House. We were talking earlier, and uh, you remembered that your first speech as Foreign Secretary, uh, well, I think, was here in uh, Chatham House. So that's good. Now, David is no stranger to you all. Uh, he was member of uh, Parliament for South Shields from 2001 to 2013. He was a leading figure in the Labour governments of 1997 to 2010, uh, Secretary of State for the Environment, uh, and of course Foreign Secretary uh, between 2007 and 2010. Um, and we worked together closely then, uh, and I have very good memories of those times, and I hope you do as well, David, and much of that time we spent together on your visits to the Middle East. Since uh, resigning his seat as MP for South Shields, he has become uh, president of the International Rescue Committee, uh, one of the leading uh, NGOs uh, in the humanitarian field, with an extraordinary history. Uh, its founding uh, in 1933 was closely related to the Nazi seizure of power uh, in Germany, and Albert Einstein played a leading role in the uh, founding of the IRC. Um, in my career uh, in uh, Cambodia and the Balkans and the Middle East, I've had the privilege of working closely uh, with your colleagues over the last 20, 25 years. Now, th this meeting, we will start with a conversation between myself and David for 20, 25 minutes or something like that, and then we'll open it up to uh, Q&A. David, so let, let, let's, let's start. One of the things I was, was reading in, in preparation for uh, your um, remarks today was the annual report last year, 2015, of the UN High Commission for Refugees. And, uh, of course, that's an, that, uh, an organization that deals with the refugee question and deals with displacement. And the sheer scale of displacement of peoples that we are facing uh, at the moment is extraordinary. I think HCR talked about 60 million people uh, currently displaced at the beginning of uh, 2015. And, of course, one knows that in the past 12 months uh, that has uh, increased. The heart of that problem at the moment seems to be in the Middle East, but we see it also in other areas, Africa and Southeast Asia and so on. What, what, what is your perspective on the scale of this global refugee crisis and, and why are we facing this tragic situation? Very much, Michael, and thank you to Chatham House for organizing this event. Look, I think the, the exam question, if you like, is almost harder. It's why should more people be fleeing conflict than at any time since 1945, when there are fewer wars going on between states than at any time for two or 300 years. So interstate conflict, wars between states, are at a record low. It's a remarkably peaceful period of human history. But, as you say, 60 million people around the world, one in every 122 people on the planet, is fleeing violence. And the explanation for that is that there are civil wars taking place in a significant number, a couple of dozen embers or hot civil wars, and they are driving people from their homes in un unheard of numbers. But there's also something different. It's not just that more people are fleeing conflict. They're fleeing conflict predominantly or significantly in Muslim-majority countries. So the implosion in the Islamic world in Afghanistan, in the Middle East, is driving this. Uh, the international system is unprecedentedly divided, certainly since the end of the Cold War, and in some ways weaker than during the Cold War. So the, the, if you like, the, the ballast of the system is weaker than um, before. And these people are, whether they be refugees, just for, the, just for completeness, of the 60 million, 20 million people are refugees. That means they've crossed national boundaries, and 40 million are internally displaced, so they're within their own country. Uh, these people are not isolated from the rest of the population, which has historically been the case. Historically, the iconic image of a refugee was someone in a refugee camp. 
but today 60% of refugees are in urban areas. In the Middle East, only 15% are in refugee camps. So people who are displaced across boundaries or are displaced within their own countries are increasingly part of the general population, not separate from it. Right. And so there's unprecedented scale and very new demands in terms of how you provide an adequate humanitarian response. And I think it's worth understanding both the causes, the drivers of this displacement, uh, but also thinking about how you treat the symptoms. Mm. I was struck by one remark you made in your answer then about, I think you talked about an implosion in the Islamic world. Is that right? Well, I, yeah, I, I, I think it's worth, you see, it's, it's mm. very, it'd be very easy for me to say here, look, we're in a situation where there are these weak states around the world, mm and we've got a weak international system, mm. and to stop there. Mm. Because the truth is, the minute one talks about mm. challenges of a world that isn't one's own, right. one's venturing into very tricky territory. Mm. But it would, be, it would just be dishonest for me not to report that 40% or so of the countries that the IRC is working in are now Muslim-majority countries. Right. That one-fifth of our programming is in the Syria region. We're a $700 million organization. We've got 22,000 staff around the world. One-fifth of our effort is now in the Middle East. Right. And it seems to me there are big questions, big debates happening within Islam yes. about the reconciliation of mm. Islam to modernity, of Islam to uh, democracy, of uh, different segments within the Islamic tradition. Right. To pretend that that's not part of the story it seems to me to be, wouldn't be right. I agree with, with a lot of that. I'll, I'll push back a little, because one of the Islamic countries I know very well is Indonesia, which is actually the world's largest yeah. uh, Muslim country, and is actually a very good example of uh, a transition has been made since the end of the Suharto period in 98, 99, to what is now a reasonably democratic Well, system. I think that's a great but point. Is, isn't the heart of the problem perhaps less the Islamic world than uh, governance in the Arab world? Well, I think that if you look at what's happening in Afghanistan and Pakistan, you can't confine your analysis to the Arab world. Fair enough. Um, and, and what I would say to your rejoinder is that it's less of a pushback, it's more texture. Mm -hmm. And I would be the first to say this isn't the whole of the Islamic world, mm. it's not all Islamic countries, mm. but in, in, I think I said significant parts of the Islamic world, there, is, there are these debates. Now, Indonesia is the world's largest uh, Islamic democracy, you could say that, um, uh, you could give the example of Bangladesh as well. Look, this is not, right. it's not right to pretend that the whole of the Islamic world, that all Muslim majority countries are undergoing this implosion. But I think if you look at the story in South Asia over the last 30 years and the story in the Middle East yeah. over the last 20 years, um, obviously it's not all internal, um, yeah. then that's part of the story. Okay. Where, for the IRC, uh, and you're president of the IRC now, where, 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 in the circumstances where, of, the, of the present uh, crisis, how, how do you prioritize the system? Well, I wish people, th people say to me, well, you know, you've got this um, $700 million budget. How do you decide where to put your uh, resources? And I, my answer is I wish I was sitting there with $700 million and deciding where to put it. The truth is that 85% of our funds mm. come from government donors, to whom we're very grateful, right. but that means they're choosing that the money has to go mm. in this direction for this purpose, mm. rather than, and they're saying we want, we want teacher training in Pakistan, we want healthcare inside Syria, we want um, basic uh, education to be delivered uh, in uh, Niger. Mm. I'm not able, I can set the priorities for the grants and contracts that we apply for, mm. uh, but I can't divide up the money. Right. And now what's interesting for us, I think, is that we've been through a process of saying we've got to be really hard-headed about where we decide to work. Mm. So we've set three, what we call entry criteria, mm. for opening up an office. Right. Is there a crisis or a threat of crisis? Mm. Because we're, we're essentially a, we're a crisis organization, not an anti-poverty organization, mm. per se. Secondly, uh, is there poverty and vulnerability? Mm. And thirdly, is there lack of local or other international capacity? Mm. And only if all three of those criteria are met do we then deploy our teams uh, there. So, uh, for example, we, decide, we did an assessment in, in Italy and we decided it wasn't justified mm. for us to uh, deploy there. But when we went to Greece and saw the situation on Lesbos, where more than half of the uh, 
refugees are arriving in Greece, they desperately needed us. And there wasn't the sufficient local capacity. And uh, we've now got 300 staff in Lesbos. Right. So uh, we've got to be quite strict about what grants and contracts we apply for. Mm. But we're not independent actors in the sense of being able to just have our own pot of money. We're not living off right. an endowment or, or, or our own uh, funds. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I've been in, in Lebanon and in Jordan in the last six months or so, and of course the IRC is, is very active in both those countries, uh, and both Lebanon and Jordan uh, have been coping, and coping reasonably well, with the extraordinary influx of uh, Syrian uh, refugees. But only in the last few days, King Abdullah of Jordan has spoken very forcefully uh, about the limits to which uh, his country can cope with uh, this problem. Could, could you reflect on that, but also reflect on, on what it means uh, in the sense of, has Europe done enough mm. to well, help look, these countries? I, I think people don't quite get the scale of this still. Look, Jordan is a country of six and a half million people. Correct. It's got 650,000 registered refugees. The government says there's another 650,000 non-registered refugees. Mm -hmm. That's already talking 18, 20% of the population. Right. Lebanon is a country of four and a half million people. By all estimates, it's got more than a million refugees. So one yes. in four Leban people living in Lebanon is now a refugee. When I'm in the US, I say, look, that's like the, the, the figure for, for Lebanon is like the whole of Germany coming to the US in the space of uh, four years. Um, you can do the maths about what Absolutely. it means in uh, Britain. It's not about 6,000 people in Calais. It's about the whole of Romania mm. coming to the UK in the space of uh, four years. So what these countries have put up with, what these countries have mm. done, is frankly an extraordinary story of resilience. Yes. Extraordinary story of re resilience, generosity, spirit, uh, etc. Equally, we've been saying for 18 months the situation inside Syria and the situation in the neighbors, the tightening you know, in Jordan now, there's no longer free health care for um, refugees. In Lebanon, there's now visa regime for uh, Syrians, which is unprecedented. We've been saying this is going to lead these twin forces, the situation inside the country and the situation in, uh, in the neighbors, is going to lead mm. to a refugee exodus. Mm. And it pains me to say that that's what's happened last summer. And the, uh, in that sense, one can only say that the countries of Europe mm. have uh, been, um, have shown themselves unable or unwilling mm. to address the crisis before it became a real crisis on their own shores. And to be fair to the prime ministers of Greece and Italy, they've been jumping yes. up and down for two or three years saying this is a major problem here. Mm. But with the Greek Euro crisis, with the Ukraine situation over the last two or three years, mm. there hasn't been the bandwidth to mm. address it. And Europe is now playing catch up. Yeah. And that it's much more difficult to play catch up mm. in public policy than mm. to, to get ahead of the game. Now, the, um, my reflection for a British audience, though, would be as follows. Mm. Leaving the European Union would not push the refugee problem further away. And if anything, it would do the opposite. I think Alan Johnson has made this point, that yes. instead of having a customs post in France, it'll have to retreat 26 miles mm -hmm. to the UK. And so the, uh, the, my um, joy at Heathrow Airport having a shower this morning was to switch on the Today program and listen to uh, Liam Fox telling us why uh, leaving the European Union would cure our problems. And obviously my reaction to that was to say, well, hang on, what the European refugee crisis shows is not too much European integration, but actually yes. too little, too little coordination. And I really think it's a, there's a warning for British citizens, of which I'm one and will be voting in the referendum. Good. Let's not kid ourselves that we can change geography by withdrawing from the European Union. We can't. We're part of Europe. And some people think we're doomed to be part of Europe, and people like me think we're blessed to be part of uh, Europe. And Britain's deal in Europe, the idea that we're victimized in Europe when we pay £1.40 per person per week to be a member of the European Union, we are not victimized as members of the uh, European Union. And actually, it's a ballast for order and stability in the world. And of course, it should be doing better, but it will do better if we're part of it rather than if we're absent from it. Right. Well, I, I agree with you very much there, David.
Although I was a little taken aback when you said you listened with joy to Liam Fox, but I, 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 I switched on the. I missed you. You told me that I, I, if I'd switched, if I'd been five minutes earlier, I'd have been yeah, able to exactly. listen to you. So I'm sorry. Exactly. Um, now we we meet uh, whilst uh, talks are going on in Geneva. Uh, my former colleague Stefan de Mistura is engaged with uh, the parties to the conflict there. This has been going on for several days now, and of course tomorrow. We have the donors conference here uh, in London. Different uh, conferences, one on the, on the political level, obviously, and tomorrow's on the humanitarian level. What, have you, what are your hopes and expectations for these meetings? Well, the first thing I'd say is that there's a real tragedy that the political and the humanitarian are so divorced. Yes. I mean, one of the tragedies of the Syrian conflict for five years mm -hmm. is that the political track and the humanitarian mm -hmm. track have been kept so far apart. Yeah. And one has to say that. So the good news, I think, is that um, the British government and the, um, the co-conveners of the conference, the UN, yep. Kuwait, Germany, mm. and Norway, um, really uh, deserve credit mm. for recognizing that the, not just the scale, mm. but the nature of the humanitarian right. response has to change. And the way I put mm. it the other day is that the conveners of the conference have recognized that we have to end the fiction that there is a short-term problem Yes. of Syrian refugees, it's a long-term problem. And so the focus of the conference, which is to say issues of education, issues of economy in the neighboring mm. states, issues of work and education are mm. a lifeline, not a luxury, mm. is a really important uh, point. And I, mm. I, I think it's, it's a great um, pleasure for me to be able to say to a US audience, mm. international aid is an area of cross-party consensus in the UK, not just Correct. in the scale of the of aid, but in many aspects of its focus as well. So I think that mm -hmm. I, I, the, 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 the sense I have is that people are coming to the conference tomorrow realizing that business as usual is not enough. This can't just be another donor conference that raises 40% of the money that's uh, right. asked for. It's got to not just raise money, it's also got to think in a different way mm. about a humanitarian response in the neighboring states to Syria. Mm. Having said that, the most difficult thing mm. is what about the poor people inside Syria? Yes, of course. Mm. Because there are six and a half million people in humanitarian need inside Syria. We've got 2,000 staff inside Syria at the moment. Mm. Every day working, Syrians who are working right. inside Syria. We wow. deliver about 360,000 people a year, get their health care from the IRC inside Syria, range of other services that we uh, provide in different provinces of Syria. But the people in besieged, is it 400,000 people who are in besieged communities? That means yes. that they have no aid getting in. Yeah. Six and a half million in humanitarian need out of, po of a remaining population of 17 million. That agenda of how you offer protection for those people. Mm. I think is the hardest one to make progress on because there is daily flouting of UN Security Council resolutions, total lack of Correct. accountability for essentially for war crimes, and the, uh, the situation there seems to me to be requiring of the same kind of leap that mm. we're, I'm hopeful that we're going to see on the, uh, on the economic and uh, education mm. front. We've said that you've got to think in terms of a million work permits for Syrians in Turkey, Jordan, and Lebanon, and that's only possible if those countries are offered massive long-term financing mm. for adjusting their economic and social infrastructure to meet the new reality that there's going to be a lot of Syrians living in those countries for a long time to come. But that's, that, that's tough on the neighbors, isn't it? I mean, I mentioned King Abdullah's remarks uh, only yes, yesterday that he talked about, look, we can't cope with much more. And indeed, they're keeping large numbers now north of the border in that, that no man's land between Syria and uh, Jordan. And then if we, if we look at Turkey, which, of course, has uh, helped. Um, there seems to be a toughening attitude um, uh, there. How does IRC... Well, I think there's a toughening, in, I mean, toughening in the sense of that there's, in all three countries, mm. there is a, the, 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 they realize that, it, that they can't uphold the fiction that this is a mm. short-term problem. Mm. And there's been a tightening, I suppose, rather than a toughening. Mm. Now, the only basis for engaging with the um, neighbors is to say, look, you'll only be able to bear this burden mm. if we, the international community, uh, support you. Mm. Not just through humanitarian aid, but through economic financing. I, I think people don't understand this. The World Bank mm. is barred from working in Jordan and Lebanon mm. because they're classified as middle-income countries. Yes, it's an absolute nonsense. So you've got a multilateral economic system. Mm. Uh, if you like, the left hand and the right hand aren't working together. And the purpose of this conference, which I think, is, is well-founded, 
is to say, look, the left hand and the right hand have got to work in sync. You cannot have a sustainable humanitarian response that is only social services. It's got to be an economic offer, both to the countries and to the refugees. Right. Um, justice. Uh, I worked in the, in the Balkans in the 90s. Uh, terrible things uh, happened there. Uh, the 8,000 people killed, uh, boys and, and, and men, killed in Srebrenica in 24 hours. At least afterwards, there was some international justice. There were tri tribunals in which I myself was uh, a witness for the prosecution uh, against the likes of Milosevic and Miladic and Karadzic. And indeed, the tragedy of the Balkans in the 90s was an impetus for the foundation of the International Criminal Court. Do you think we're ever going to see justice in the case of Syria? And do you not see the conflict in Syria as a real setback for international justice and human rights? Well, it's easier to answer the second question than the first, and the answer is yes. I mean, it's worth saying for this audience, it's nice to be able to say it in public, Michael has been incredibly modest about his own contribution to international affairs over the last 30 or 40 years. He was an extraordinarily distinguished public servant through the UN. I mean, his work as the special representative on Lebanon was really of the highest order, and it's nice to be able to say, Thank you. pay tribute to you publicly uh, on that. Look, I think that the, uh, the fact that 50, uh, 10 years after the passage of something called Responsibility to Protect, yes. which was 190 plus mm nations of the UN signing up to the principle that when a mm. government abused the rights mm. of its own citizens, then there was a responsibility on the international community mm. to do something about it. Ten years later, you have a government barrel bombing its own yes. citizens, mm. taking medical supplies off UN-sanctioned lorries that are going into mm. Syria to deliver medical aid mm. without, um, uh, without mm. accountability mm. is a very, very serious state right. of affairs. So is the Syria conflict a setback to international norms of human rights, of uh, humanity, really. Definitely. Definitely. And mm. fundamentally, why is that? Fundamentally, because the Security Council is divided. In the end, when, yes. the, when you have the scale of the division that you have in the UN Security Council that exists at the moment uh, over this issue, mm. it, it, then you, the system becomes gridlocked. Yeah. And even the we, we worked to pass these uh, humanitarian resolutions, three resolutions on humanitarian yes. aid. Mm. The situation is worse today than when the resolutions were passed. Yeah, no doubt about that. And there was a lot of coverage of Medea. Uh, mm. We're working in a town 30 kilometers south of Medea mm. um, where you've got similar situation going on. Mm. And the uh, I mean, unspeakable horror being perpetrated, both directly and indirectly. Mm. Um, and. It, it, this comes home very, um, what's the right word, um, starkly. Uh, we, we're, unu we're unique, in fact, the IRC, in that we're, we work in war zones, we work yes. in fragile states, we work in transit states, but we also resettle 10,000 refugees a year in the US. Mm. Um, now, the US has taken very few Syrian refugees, which is an argument that we've got with the US government, but mm. some of those that got in then found that the states that they were due to go to said they didn't want them. And so there's a family that I met last month who were uh, temporarily holed up with us in New York. I mean, they eventually got to the state that they were mm. due to go to. And the starkness of the abuse is that this is a family that had been in Jordan for two years. Mm -hmm. uh, they, one of the um, sons ha had a limp from, from an injury that he'd suffered as a result of a barrel bomb. They've still got, a, uh, their daughter is still in Daraa where the conflict started uh, five years ago. And just the day before, mm. a, a, a Russian bomb mm. had landed on the house next door to mm. them. Yeah. So you've got civilians in the line of fire in, I think it's not unfair mm. to say, and I'm, you, I mean, you've got a strong historical sense of this, an unprecedented mm. fashion. And as far as I can see, while you've got such deep division in the Security Council, then you're not going to get any progress. Having said that, do I think it's, it's hopeless Mm. That, there would, that there will be accountability for. I don't think that's hopeless for two mm. reasons. Mm. One, the record right. keeping on this conflict, partly because of the mm -hmm. extraordinary advances in new media uh, and the work of people mm. like the Syrian Observatory, yes. mean that there are records of this conflict that haven't existed, in, for mm. example, in Sri Lanka and elsewhere in recent history. Right. There haven't been the same sort of uh, right. documentation and, yeah. uh, and records. And secondly, 
you don't know how this is going to end. And when the Russians say that they don't have a fealty, a loyalty to Assad per se, I think that's true. I, I'm sure. So, so I don't think it's impossible that there can be accountability afterwards. I mean, you touched there on the question of Russia, and of course Russia is a, a member of the P5 at the Security Council, perhaps the most important member along with that, uh, with the United States. And, um, and what to do about Russia? I told you uh, before we came in here, I was looking yesterday evening and came across some remarks you made in 2008 on a visit to Ukraine and Georgia, uh, when the then government of President Medvedev was putting those two countries under enormous uh, pressure. Um, now we're six, seven years after that, and we can see what's happened uh, in the Ukraine. Uh, we see the intervention in, in Syria. Um, this is a real crisis for the international community in a way, isn't it? If, if Russia is, is behaving in, in such an, a, a front in, a front to the norms of uh, what should bind us together. Yeah, I mean, one caution I would, I always make, is that when, when British people talk about Russia and Russian people talk about Britain, mm. it, it can often, it, it's sort Some of overlain history. with the following point. Brit British people think that Russia is a declining power. Mm. Russian people think that Britain is a declining power. Surely not. And we might both be right. So. So that, uh, there's a degree, I mean, I, I think one's got to, th th there's, a, there's a lot of burden of, of history and for everything that we say they violate norms, they would say that we're violating norms. And you can't go more than five minutes in a discussion with a Russian official without them reminding you about the embassy in Belgrade. And you know, there's, yes. a, yes. there's a litany that exists on, on both sides. I think that um, the most interesting, mm -hmm. quote unquote, academic question, but it's actually got real, mm. real, um, Mm. political consequences every day in international relations mm. is the following. Should you fear, should we fear more a strong Russia or a weak Russia? Yes. And I think that's a really tough question mm. because a lot of people might think, well, with the declining oil price, Russia will be weaker, it's going to be more malleable, it's going to be more amenable to uh, mm. compromise, but that's evidently not uh, been the case. Equally, for, for obvious reasons, people are leery and worried about a, a strong Russia. Yes. Mm. Uh, and it seems to me that those are very deep questions of psychology as well as mm. economy and society mm. within uh, Russia. Remember, it's an incredibly yeah. educated population by international Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. standards. And I have a residual faith that mm. the, uh, the advances that we're seeing in demands for accountable government uh, mm. across the world, actually, they're not going to leave Russia empty of this, mm -hmm. even with control of the media, to give up on the hope that the Russian middle class will um, assert itself mm -hmm. seems to me to be wrong, but I, I, I don't think that's a short-term uh, issue. And what I would say from the outside, as someone running a humanitarian organization, is that when Russia and the US are so divided mm -hmm. on such a fundamental issue of humanitarian concern, the defining humanitarian crisis of the 21st century so far, mm -hmm. then the humanitarian system is starting with a ball and chain around its, around its leg.